senior producer from NFL Films and also co-host of ESPN's NFL Matchup Show. It is Greg Cosell joining us on the line. And Greg's segment every week is brought to you by Scott Lawn Yard, an official commercial site work partner of the Buffalo Bills. Greg, how are we doing this week? Uh, well, I'm doing okay. How are you guys doing? Uh, that was kind of a, uh, uh, a heavy sweat game the other night, you know? Oh, yeah. Bills fans chewed their fingernails the, down to yeah. the nub. It was the most painful win I've sat through in a long, long time. Yeah, that was <clears throat> no points at the half. God, it was – who knew what was going to happen in the second half at that point? Right. And that's the kind of the, – that's the theme of our show this week. People are trying to figure out – first of all, Monday we called – people called in and we were all trying to fix it, right? What – trying to help them get out of this, this penchant for slow starts. Certainly they couldn't catch up to the Jaguars <laughs> yeah. in London which, because of a slow start. Same thing this last week against the Giants, although What'd the Giants weren't enough Steve? to hold them. Uh, I, when people ask me those kinds of questions, I feel like I never have a great answer, and I'm just being honest. Do you guys have a great answer? Play better. <laughs> That's his answer. Brownie, uh, you want to add to that? Not really. Um, I think it's largely, <laughs> I think it's largely an execution issue. Um, just kind of looking back at the tape and stuff, there are instances where, you know, you have simple mental mistakes, whether it's. Gabe Davis not putting the ball in his outside arm and a fumble happens and it stays in the field of play and it's a turnover. Um, you know, you can go all the way back to the Jacksonville game and the two first two series, you know, Cook can't catch a ball in the right flat where he has the angle and can run for the first down. They're punting. Next right. series, Dalton Kincaid catches it on third down. Can't get to the sticks. Let's a 190 pound defensive back, knock him out of bounds. So you know. to me, it's largely execution. You know, I think the way I always look at these things, and, and they're not the only team that, you know, I've been, I've been doing this in a long time, as you guys have. So we've seen these kinds of things before. I've, you know, obviously I've seen it with many teams in the league. Your focus is more on the Bills. I always feel like there's a macro reason and a micro reason. You've hit a lot on the micro reasons, individual plays that you can always point to. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that I think stands out to me watching the Bills offense, and again, this is where also the macro and the micro do merge, but there have not been as many explosive pass plays this year as there have been in the past. Um, and again, as I said, that's where the macro and the micro merge because it's not as if they never run intermediate or vertical routes, but for different reasons on different plays, those are not there. Those plays are not being made down the field, either because ball's not being thrown, coverage takes it away, maybe Josh at times gets out of the pocket a little too quick. You know, there's Steve, as you know, having played, there's always 10 reasons. There's never one right. reason. Fans like there to be one reason, but there's never one reason. But is there uh, one solution, right? I mean, that's the question. Can they fix yeah. it by saying, listen, can we protect better? Uh, can we give him one more outlet? Can we run the ball a little better? Can we do so? And, you know, certainly uh, Brownie and I have sat here and you, know, you go back and look at the All-22 and maybe you can shed some light on this. There seems to be enough options open on these passing routes that they could stay on the field more consistently than they've been able to in the beginning of these two, last two games. Yeah, you know, I mean, again, now you get into individual plays and, right. and, and ultimately – that's that's what happens with you know plays that are that are there or that seem to be there end up not being executed for any number of reasons. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Um, there was a second quarter play that was third and fourteen. Um, Allen had Davis on the deep curl beyond the sticks versus an outside leverage corner. Okay, but he left the pocket to his right, and then he made a second reaction incomplete throw to Diggs. Now. Allen never looked to, to Davis and that should have been the read to me based on the movement of the safety. So you end up with a third and 14 that should have been a 20 yard completion and it's a punt. I mean, then they run the ball really, really well. And then you get to um, uh, a play that they love right after three cook runs. One of their staple plays that conventional bang play action with dig for digs from the reduced split running the condensed skinny. And, you know, we've seen them, hit that play over and over, not only in the field, but in the red zone for touchdowns. And 
Okereke from the backside just gets his hand on the ball on a play that probably would have been a 25 or 30 yard gain because there was a ton of room for Diggs after he caught the ball. So these are the micro plays, the plays that are seemingly there that are not getting made. And, you know, these these are plays that that short circuit drives. Right. And we've seen that each of the last two weeks, because before the before these last two games, the Bills had five three and outs all season. Through the first right. four, through the first four games, and I think they have seven. I think they have six or seven in the last two alone. Um, wanted to kind of bend your ear a little bit, Greg, on Josh under center and Josh yeah, in the topic. shotgun. So let's compare the production, if we could, and why we think one has been more productive than the other, per se. Well. Let's just talk about play action under center as a general principle, which is true for any team, but it's certainly true for the Bills, but it's it's just universal stuff. Um, when you're under center, a number of things are different. Uh, number one, depending on the kind of run you you show, a couple of things happen. Number number one, it takes longer for second level to pl- second level defenders to know whether it's run or pass because it takes longer to get to the mesh point. Secondly, if you run some kind of outside zone-ish look, doesn't have to be hardcore outside zone, but something that has a little bit more of a path that's outside zone-ish, the, the defensive line, their first step is horizontal, not vertical toward the quarterback. So that slows the rush down. Play action under center also gives Josh the chance to get more depth in the pocket, which then gives him more time away from the rush. Normally, when you run play action under center too, the reads are not as detailed. So you focus less on reading defenses and, and coverages and more on focusing on the routes and where you want to throw the ball. So you get more depth, you, 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 you're more defined in your reads. Um, and, you know, those are all good things. You know, play action from the shotgun is very quick. It's almost like flash fakes. Um, it doesn't have a major impact on the defense. And the depth, you know, the drop back is totally different. So I'm, I personally am a big believer just from years of film study in an under center play action. I think it's a more effective way to run play action. Yeah. And it, how important is it to actually be able to run the football out of that? Or does that really matter um, as long as you're under center? That's always been a big question, Steve. And, and one can make the argument that, you do not have to be a great running team to execute under center play action effectively because defensive players are not necessarily conscious of how many carries or how many yards you're getting running the ball. Now, obviously if you're running it well, um, then clearly defensive players, because they want to be physical, they want to hit, they think in terms of, Hey, we got to buck up and now we got to stop the run. So there's no question. There's that element to it but they still play their keys and they still react. So you don't have to be a great running team. I mean, I used to hear, you know, years ago, and not to bring up bad memories for you, Steve, but like the Cowboys with Aikman and Smith, people would say, well, they got to come out and run the ball to establish the run. No, they don't. Their runs established just by who they were. They didn't have to come out and run the ball. You know, defenses are our game planning to stop the run. You know, so it, it it's... It's always been a debatable point. I fall on the side that you don't have to have a great run game in order to execute under center play action. All right. So, Greg, in this matchup, after seeing how inordinately targeted Diggs was in the last game, yeah, because I think he was targeted like 12 times in the first half, and it was like one or two targets for everybody else at most. And there was only two or three other players on the halftime stat board. And that continued to a certain extent in the second half. Knowing how Belichick's defenses are usually good at taking away your number one option, what are you anticipating from New England, knowing full well in the last six games, Diggs has had, I think, four 100-yard efforts against the Patriots and six touchdowns in six games. They've yeah, no, they've been, been very good against the Patriots, very good. So here's the question. With Kincaid out this week, they had almost 80% of their offensive snaps in 11 personnel. You you tend to believe that that's not going to happen because Kincaid has been cleared, correct? Correct. So he's going to play. So normally, normally, and again, with Bill Belichick, I know they're a bad team this year. You know, 
but there are still tendencies that he plays. He doesn't just do crazy stuff. Normally, when he plays against 12 personnel, you tend to see a lot of big nickel, meaning three safeties. So I would assume the Bills would go back to some meaningful meaningful percentage of 12 personnel with Kincaid back. Would you guys agree that that's likely to happen? Yeah, I think that's I fair would, to say. Yeah, at least a, s more 12 than they have run last. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying they're going to be 70% 12, right. but I would think they'd be, you know, 40% give or take. You know, Kincaid's going to be on the field. Um, so if they play big nickel, the question becomes, is he going to play zone out of that or is he going to play man out of that? And that's something we don't know the answer to. But I, I don't think, and I, we see the same thing in Philadelphia where I'm closest to, I don't think your pass game can live on one guy. Now, you, that can happen for a couple of weeks. It you know, can happen in given games. But guys, I don't think that can happen over the course of a season. I think you have to get other players involved. And that begs the question, which again is a difficult answer, and I'm just being honest, as to why it has not been the case. And I can't answer that. That would be a Ken Dorsey, Josh Allen question, or and maybe the quarterback coach, and I'm not sure who that is. But um, you know, I think that's a question that needs you got to figure that out because you know G Gabe Davis, he's now been there four or five years, and he has a couple of games every year where you go, Oh my god, this guy's really a big time number two. And then he has a lot of other games where it doesn't seem like he's part of the offense. And, and this is no knock on Gabe Davis. It might have nothing to do with him. But you can't live like this every single week. You know, even Dawson Knox, to me, I think he's a pretty talented receiver. I mean, he's, an, he's, he's athletic. Um, you know, to me, it, it, these guys need to be more involved in the pass game. It can't be Stephon Diggs, Stephon Diggs, as good as Diggs is. So when we get into a game like this where a team's one and five and they're, you know, they're, they're desperate for a win. Uh, but we're, you know, we're watching some of their, the all 22 for their game against uh, the. Their offense is painful to watch, Steve. Right. And their defense. I, the thing I noticed overall about their defense, I, you're not going to convince me that Bill Belichick and the guys over there in that coaching staff have forgotten how to coach. But their no, defense no. seems, and Brown and I are talking, it seems a little bit slow. They're slow. It seems like they're, they, they can't, you know, they just can't keep up sometimes. The, I the would Raiders, agree with that. I think, yeah. they, I think they are a slow defense that lacks really good personnel, and you can only camouflage that and compensate for that, you know, in so many ways. And, and because their offense, and again, we can discuss that if you like, you know, uh, um, there's a lot to say about their offense, but because they can't really score a lot, they can't they can't, you know, make up for their defense. You know, it's one thing if you can score a lot of points and you figure, hey, we can win games 31-24. They can't do that. So, you know, they're really not a very talented team, which is an odd thing to say about the Patriots, given what their history has been. But they're really not particularly talented on either side of the ball. Okay, so the off – and I realize that a lot of their offensive problems stem from their offensive line, which has already had four different line combinations through the first six weeks. And they don't – I would call Devontae Parker, if not elite, close to an elite physical talent, but he has never yeah. had – he has never had week-to-week -week <laughs> consistency in his entire nope. career. So you have that on one hand. I think Kendrick Bourne is – is their most reliable offensive weapon right now. I think that's probably fair. Um, and he's probably, I hate categorizing receivers, but he's probably a number three in, in a, if you had right. a, you know, a good offense. Um, you, you know, there's a couple of things we have not seen at all. First of all, you have to start with the quarterback. Um, he's a certain kind of quarterback. I don't think, you know, obviously, I'm sure in New England, they probably think they're done with him, but he's a certain kind of quarterback. He He's a and I hate to use these words, but people understand he's a complimentary player. Um, he needs a run game, and they've been unable to run the ball with any kind of meaningful production through six games. And they need the run game, both from a volume and production standpoint, for their offense to have any chance to be successful. They only have eight rushes of 10 plus yards, which is the second lowest in the league. Um, and then on top of that, they've not shown any kind of meaningful intermediate or vertical passing game. Uh, some of that's O-line based. I think that it's it's been clear watching the tape that there have been sort of sync issues with, with Jones and the quarterbacks uh, and the receivers, excuse me. Um, you know, and, and um, I don't think 
This is just my sense. Only Mac Jones can answer this question. I'm just trying to extrapolate guys from watching the tape. My sense is Jones does not have a lot of faith either in his protection or in his receiver's ability to win one-on-one. And it's really tough to play quarterback that way. And it's tough for a play caller. Should he have faith in it? In either one? Um, that, that's yeah. a fair question. And, and, and <laughs> the easy answer would probably be no. But, Steve, you played in this league a long time. At some point, you, you know, you still have to line up and play. I mean, yeah. you can't play scared. And, you know, but, you know, it's still it's still human beings. And it's still human nature. And right. the old line, I mean, they're starting two rookie guards. They're starting a free agent right tackle who had all kinds of problems last week with Max Crosby. Um, and obviously Max Crosby is arguably one of the three or four best edge rushers in the league. Um, but still, you know, at some point you've got to line up and try to execute what you're asked to execute. Not only Mac Jones, everybody, but it's, it's been a problem. I mean, this is, there's no two ways around it. This has been a really difficult offense to watch. I mean, you know, obviously I've been watching it to some degree. Maybe I missed a game or two, but it's not been an easy offense to watch. All right, so let's look at Buffalo's defense, which is still trying to come up with full-time solutions for some of the all-pro talent that they've lost. Dorian Williams makes his first start last week, Greg, and is once again noticeable, active, all over yeah. the field. Ten tackles on the night, a quarterback hit on Tyrod when he chases him out in the flat on a scramble play. And him and Bernard... They might be a little undersized, but, but man, do they, they get to the football in a hurry. Yeah, I, I, you know, from the time they drafted him, as you guys remember, I, I told you I really liked his college tape, and this is the way in which he played. And by the way, he played this way all through training camp. And I know he got hurt, um, you know, in the games that, you know, when he did play in the preseason games, this is what he looked like, guys. Wouldn't you agree? You noticed yeah. him in the preseason game. He was the leading right. tackler in the preseason for the defense. Yeah, so, again, not being there every day and knowing what he can handle mentally at this point. I don't know the answer to that, but the bottom line is, is they've got two, even though they might be a little undersized, they've got two fast slow linebackers. And in today's NFL, that's a good thing. So, you know, you have to figure both will continue to develop since they're young players. Um, and obviously they're going to play this year because Milano is going to be out for the year. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a real positive, uh, you know, I, I think they're still trying to figure out corner. You know, the last thing you want to have happen, and you guys are well aware of this, okay? We saw it a little bit last week, even though the Giants only, you know, put up nine, is the last thing you want to have happen. You mentioned Devontae Parker. With, with, with sort of trying to figure out the corner position, it being a little bit of a work in progress, the last thing you want to give up are big explosive plays. And all, you know, you're playing great defense, and you give up two or three of those, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're trailing 17-13 in the fourth quarter, and it feels like, oh, my God, where'd this game go? Which is exactly what happened last week. Right. And when you talk about these linebackers, uh, Bernard and Williams, how critical thus far has the play of the defensive tackles in front of them, how much has that given them the ability not, you know, not to have to step up and overcome that? Um, the defensive line of the Bills have been playing really well. How well have they been playing? I would that. And, and how and much have they Oliver's helped those young well, guys? But he's out this week, right? Isn't right. he officially yeah. out? He's out. So, I mean, they do have depth there. It's not as if they're putting in guys off the street. They do have good depth, but he's played well. Um, you know, and I think they've gotten good play off the edge this year. I mean, I've been very, very impressed on tape with Leonard Floyd. He's played really, really good football. And, you know, he's going to be up again. Unless New England makes a change, I don't know their injury status. But unless they make a change, is it for Darian Lowe again at right tackle, as far as you guys know? No, no, I no, I don't think I don't see any trade on the horizon. So, you know, if it's low again at right tackle, then you're going to have Floyd working against him. I mean, you know, I think, look, everybody thought last week and that's why they play the games, guys. Everybody thought last week in Buffalo, Bills 31, Giants 10 would be what everybody thought it was going to be. It didn't work out that way. You know, this game's in New England. Um you know, and they know they have a short week afterwards playing Thursday night. You know, this is a week where you'd like to see them come out quick and fast and strong like they did numerous times a year ago. And all of a sudden in the second quarter, it's 21-3. And not that you pack it up and go home at that point, but you feel like you've got a big cushion. Yeah, right. Uh, is there anything 
that you can foresee that would make the Patriots even marginally more competitive on offense because well, even it's even their run game, yeah. Greg. I mean, their run. I mean, Ramondre Stevenson's production has fallen off a cliff. He's averaging three a, a yards a carry. Cliff, total cliff. They they've not been able to run the ball, Brownie. I mean, look, all we have is the first six games. That's all we can address. But it's still NFL football. Okay, we saw that on Sunday night. So let's say all of a sudden Stevenson breaks off a 30 yarder, which he's capable of. Let's say all of a sudden, because we saw it last week with Slayton a couple of times, let's say all of a sudden Jones hits Parker for a couple of 40 yards. I mean, these things can happen, you know, so it's easy to say they're bad. And and overall, the tape suggests, you know, from like I said, to use my phrasing from earlier, a macro perspective, this is not a good offense. But, you know, you know how that goes in this league. A couple of plays here and there, and suddenly it seems games can change. And, you know, you you can't let those plays happen, especially since, quite frankly, we're a little uncertain right now how the Bills will come out offensively. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the way you see this. Uh, you know, it, there's a ton of ways you can see the Bills doing this, We're, you know, running, coming out, jumping out to a fast start. You can see the right. Bills winning this a number of ways. But if the Patriots are going to win, it's going to be a game like the Giants game or the Jets game for yep. the Bills where it's 18 to 15 or 12 to 9. Uh, or 14 to nine in the reverse, like it was for the Giants and the Bills, right? I mean, that's that's the Patriots formula. Yeah, I mean, look, it took Josh Allen making a Josh Allen play on the Morris touchdown for them to go ahead and win, and then we went down to the final. You know, I mean, look, you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to be in a situation where it's a one-score game in the fourth quarter. And you know, again, I, I spoke about some individual plays that weren't made in the first half. I mean, even Josh's interception. I mean, he threw that ball too flat. I mean, the middle was wide open. If he just put a little firm touch on that instead of throwing it too flat, God, Dawson Knox might still be running. He would have hit his head on the goalpost. You know, so it's little things like that that end up making games the way they were on Sunday night when, in fact, you know, they should have won that game. I'm sure they felt should have won that game going away. So it's, you know, it always comes down to little plays like that that change the way games get played out over the course of four quarters. Last one real quick, Greg. Uh, the three games in which Buffalo's offense have sputtered have come against three, four fronts uh, for the most part. And I know the Patriots play variations and sometimes it's a three, they, three, yeah, five yeah. and all that stuff. But again, here we are with what, in essence, for all intents and purposes, is an under front. What do you what do you think if you wanted to formulate a theory as to what that front could throw at Buffalo's offense to continue to have them sputter the way they have in previous three games against defenses with that look? A lot of post snap movement, slants, things that that impact your blocking schemes. I thought the Giants didn't do a lot of that. I thought the most impressive element to me of the game the other night was the ability to run the ball inside against what would be viewed as the strength of the Giants' defensive line, Williams and certainly Lawrence, um, I guess sexy Dexy as he likes to be called. Um, but that's the strength of the, of the Giants' D-line, and they ran the ball between the tack efficiency. So I think particularly with a rookie right guard and Torrance, who I thought played really well this past week, you want to change the look post-snap. You want to slant. You want to send guys into gaps, you know, second level players into gaps. You want to do gap exchanges, all these kinds of things, which change how you block post snap. Those are the kinds of things I would expect a Bill Belichick defense to do. You know, say what you want and you hit it right on the head. I think, Steve, you said it. You know, Belichick's not an idiot all of a sudden. You know, he's he's going to have tactics that are geared to dealing with this this offense and this run game. But I would expect to see a lot of that, Brownie. All right. Greg, thanks, man. It's great talking to you again. No, I loved it, guys. Let's hope right. uh, next week maybe we can uh, talk about an explosive offense. Yeah, that would be nice. Have a good weekend. All right. Thank you.